I'm talking to Bill Graham. Now, he's in charge of the Strategic Global Engagement Internet Society. Now, tell us, what does the society do? Well, the Internet Society was established in 1992 by the pioneers of the Internet, people like Vint Cerf, who uh, saw that there was a need for an organizational home for a lot of Internet activities that extended beyond the purely technical. We were originally set up as the organizational home for the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet Architecture Board, uh, who are obviously very technical bodies. The IETF establishes all of the standards uh, for the internet. We have expanded since that time and we're, we're now quite active in uh, capacity building was our first area. Uh, we ran network uh, education workshops for many years in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. Uh, we've now expanded to provide policy advice, uh, capacity building in that area, regulatory training, and my job, which is to uh, really make us more prominent and make the really significant differences in the internet world known in intergovernmental agencies. Right, now this is a development conference and we're talking about rolling out ICTs to parts of the world that haven't had them up until now. So your work is pretty vital in raising capacity, raising education, raising knowledge about these, these technologies. We certainly like to think so. We have uh, five regional bureaus. Uh, we have a, a development department which uh, engages in a lot of training in technical areas like internet exchange points for, for example. So tell us what is an internet exchange point and what are you doing to train people in how to manage them? Well, an internet exchange point, in simple terms, is a way of aggregating traffic within a local area, within a region, uh, and reducing the cost of access because when you, when you do a search for something on the internet, you go to the IXP rather than using the global links. So it, it really reduces the cost of access. What we do is we would really help, for example, with the landing of the new undersea cables in Kenya. We have helped to establish a, an IXP in Mombasa. Uh, the local community there obviously wasn't, uh, had no need to to have an IXP before the cable landed. We've gone in, we've, uh, we've trained people, we've helped them set up the in infrastructure, we've uh, taught them about routing, uh, how to configure their IXPs. And so now when the traffic comes in via the new cable, there's an IXP that can aggregate it and, and handle the local uh, distribution. And this is very important because it means that they're no longer dependent on outside help or outside expertise to run their network. Right, and that's something we work at a lot is a train the trainers approach. So we really make it very explicit going in when we do training that we, ex we expect that there's an obligation for the people we have trained to reach out and do training in their own area. So we're not continually bringing in outside expertise, but instead we're developing a local capacity to do their own expansion, their own training. Okay, we're beginning to see uh, a sort of a revolution taking place in terms of multilingualism on the internet. The Internet Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers has, has allowed different scripts to be included in domain names. So in Arabic, for example, you can now use uh, Arabic script rather than the Latin script. Now you're doing some work in that area as well. Could you tell us about it? Well, I guess we, we uh, as the home for the IETF, we were very much involved in developing the standards that permits that to happen. So we were absolutely thrilled to see ICANN finally rolling out the IDNs. That, that's a great step forward in internationalizing the, the internet and making it available to people who don't uh, use Latin scripts. We have a training program that complements that, that teaches people now that the IDNs are available, how do they make their own languages available? online, what are the technical aspects uh, that are required, what are the policy considerations that would enable them to do that. Is there a risk of there being many separate internets now? Because one of the initial sort of founding dreams of the internet uh, was that it would just be a single network, but there is a risk of balkanization with different domain name systems, different scripts, etc. Is that something that you worry about? 
I guess we worry about it. The, the really important issue here is one of standardization. The inter internet is developed to be interoperable. And as long as people use the IETF standards, adhere to the protocols set out by the, uh, the Internet Architecture Board, then all of those different language scripts are, are going to be able to connect to one another through the common internet based on the telecommunications infrastructure. The only danger really develops if people start developing uh, non-standard applications which uh, so far hasn't happened. We very much uh, encourage people through our capacity building programs to understand the importance of the standardization process. And the, these are exciting times because the use of Latin scripts either in domain names uh, or addressing systems has actually prevented a lot of other la marginalized languages from ending up on the net, hasn't it? Of course, when the Internet began, it was a small research network. It's now grown to really be the backbone for many of the world's economies and, and much of the communications that goes on in the world. So it's only natural that there's an expansion to, to take into account the many, many scripts that people use. It's going to be an ongoing process ensuring that all of the technical issues are dealt with so that there is no problem translating from one to another. Of course, with books, if you walk into a bookstore that sells many languages, you're only going to be able to, to make use of the ones in your own language. But the books are still interoperable, in a sense.